Well, and it is my great pleasure to um, introduce you to a woman you probably already know, the eminently qualified and beautiful and brilliant Helen Alvare, who was a professor of law. I've been been told you can't say those things at academic forums, but I'm not an academician, so I'm going to say beautiful is okay. Um, uh, Helen is a professor of law at George Mason University. Um, she has a long record of scholarship and, um, and uh, advising the church. Um, she, previous to George Mason, she was a professor at Catholic University. She is also a theologian and generally knows everything. So I decided that she was the one to convene this panel. And a lot of the folks on this panel have not met each other before, so this is an opportunity for us all to collaborate among us and with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marjorie. We want to thank the Susan B. Anthony Museum and, and Susan B. Anthony List for convening this today. Um, this is an opportunity to provoke and bring some sustained academic inquiry to the subject of really women's lived experience over the last 40 to 50 years, often combining uh, openness to being uh, a parent to uh, assuming a role in the world. I mean, what is women's lived experience? It seems it's been uh, under-discussed, under-theorized in academic circles, and we would like to uh, provoke a change in that. And I'm so grateful to the panel of scholars that we have here with us today, all of whom are coming out pretty much in their first days of beginning a new semester in order to conduct this today because it is the 90th anniversary of suffrage. Um, you will know, to introduce this topic to you, that the press and public have rightly noted the presence of an unusually large number of women running for office who declare themselves to be uh, pro-life. Um, now many are tempted to view this as purely a political or even an emotional phenomenon, um, an incidental commitment of an unusually high number of candidates who are simply running against Washington this year. Or maybe it's political opportunism, right, because pro-life voters tend to vote their preferences more intensely on the issue of abortion than those who are pro-choice. But the vitriol that you will see in the press in opposition to these candidates who are female and declaring themselves to be pro-life, the vitriol seems to indicate that something more is going on, something more is happening with the entire question of being a woman in the modern world in the 21st century. Susan Smith, writing in the Washington Post, May 20th, saying to these candidates, hey, life is bigger than a fetus. Jessica Valenti in the same paper 10 days later saying, why aren't these female candidates being, quote, laughed out of the room? Tina Brown of Vanity Fair and Good Morning America calling these women a blow to feminism. Uh, I experienced this personally at a forum just a couple of uh, months ago at a large university, a women's and peace forum, where uh, after I spoke, uh, a rather prominent writer here from New York got up and ditched her prepared remarks to, and I can't call it anything less than fuming, fuming at the microphone, that we would dare introduce a question about abortion being the linchpin and the, the, the certain future of feminism. That this, this should be off the table. This should not be permitted at a conference or at a women's conference in particular. Um, the source of this backlash is quite possibly the fear that for many women, women citizens, the relationship between uh, a legal right to abortion and their freedom and future is not axiomatic. There is a fear, perhaps, among some of the leading uh, established institutions of feminism that, um, that they haven't really uh, taken root with American women, now American women voters, intellectually, emotionally, or at the practical level in women's lived experience, this relationship between abortion and freedom and dignity and equality. In fact, maybe women have even come to believe the opposite, that um, embracing um, the possibility of being a mother while also being a citizen of institutions outside the home is not just compatible but maybe conducive to the rise of women in the long run. 
This phenomenon definitely merits more intellectual and empirical investigation than it's currently getting in the academy. I can tell you in my own discipline of family law, which I've been teaching for 11 years, that it is virtually non-existent to explore this possibility. One of the rare examples is, say, Marianne Glendon of Harvard University, who wrote a book detailing the inverse relationship between countries that have favorable policies for women who have children and for families and the, uh, their abortion policy. The U.S., a high abortion license, low um, uh, public and private policies, sort of allowing women to be flexible to welcome children into their lives. So it's a good time today and in the 21st century to be looking at the interaction between women's thinking about equality and freedom and their role as mothers. So we need to look, and today we will, at the demographic and political realities. What women, including emerging groups of women, right, immigrants, working women, are doing and saying regarding sex, pregnancy, and motherhood. We need to look at the logical and ethical arguments on this question. It's time to theorize more adequately, to develop a vocabulary for, to explore the logical, ethical, political ramifications of a feminism that takes a pro-life stance. If women, if citizens generally support with their vote and with the actual conduct of their lives a legal and cultural environment that supports childbearing and also a movement for women's continuing path to equality, dignity, and freedom, then why shouldn't the Academy perform the service of exploring this? Its history, its present, its future. This is what we hope to urge along today on this 90th anniversary of women's suffrage. You'll see from your brochure that our panel has uh, more than enough credentials, I won't read them in the interest of time, please do look at them, to take on these questions. I'm going to begin with the historian, Professor Popple from St. Louis University, continue with the political uh, science professor, Professor Wilson from Villanova, on to sociology with Professor Brad Wilcox of the University of Virginia, and conclude with the basics, the foundation of it all, philosophy with Professor Garcia of Boston College. So thank you again for coming. Thank you.